Yay! Is this, the last, this is the last time this is Being gonna happen. Being shorter than somebody is not for me. <laughs> it's not for me. This isn't my life. This is what I always wanted. wanted. This, is what, this is what I always wanted in my life. Yeah, it's gonna my sister in hell of a midlife crisis. That's gonna be amazing. <laughs> Dude, I, I, I think I just kind of stay. I actually thought a midlife crisis was a singular event. It's actually just a rolling. Wait, season. does it keep going? No, it just keeps going. I was coming out of Harvard Law School. I had expectations been, were off the charts. I mean, I thought that my life was made. Of course I, I was you like, did. I was like, I'm right. done. Right. right. I know. I was like, I'm done. Right. And I'd also like been working, been in Afghanistan, Thailand at that point, and so I just thought. You know, which... doing like human rights stuff. No? Yeah, human okay, rights stuff. Right yeah, yeah. I started at a consulting firm and then I moved to a nonprofit, but okay. that those were both temporary assignments. Like one was a couple months, and then one was like a year long fellowship. And so yeah. I was like, when I finished my fellowship, I was like, I've done it. Here I am, world. Where's all my offers? And, I'm ready. and the world was like, I don't. We don't know what to tell you. <laughs> it sucked. It sucked. Right. Um, luckily, I had a great partner at the time. I remember. He was like, what do you want to do? And I was like, I think I just want to go in the woods and cry or something. Mm -hmm. So we went, we drove up to Maine. We got this amazing cabin, nothing around. And we just like watched fireworks and I drank a bottle of champagne. And I was like, this is 30. <laughs> this is this fucking is 30. 30. It is, it is. Yeah. So where did it turn? When did the opportunities start coming? So I started waiting tables. Okay, wow. Yeah. Harvard Law to waiting, waiting tables. tables. And then I found this organization in Nicaragua that for some reason I was just really interested in. They were working with sugarcane workers that were dying of occupational disease. And I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm waiting tables. If I got to like do what I got to do, if I got to pay my dues or whatever, let me go volunteer on this interesting issue. Hey, say more about the waiting tables though thing because it, was it that you just weren't seeing jobs you wanted I could or were you not just getting find, no interest? I could not find anything. I applied for hundreds of jobs. Wow. Hundreds. And I was either overqualified or underqualified. Okay. And, um, Straight lawyer jobs or were these? They were nonprofit jobs, okay. lawyer jobs, office jobs, everything. Okay. You know, it was 2008, so like, it was, it was, it was, it was, yeah, it was a yep. mess, but it was a mess. But in any case, I needed money, so I was like, let me just go. Wait tables. And I, I saved up my money. I started learning Spanish. I taught myself Spanish. I went down to this nonprofit to volunteer. I, within like a couple months, I was head of their legal department. And then, and then I was their COO. Like I became the COO. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And that happened like all within like a year. Mm -hmm. And then I stayed there for like Three years, three or four years, and then I left and started Ready Set. Did you enjoy the work? I enjoyed the work. I did not like the people. It was a very dysfunctional, toxic environment. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. How did that? How long did it take you to feel that? And how long did you tolerate it? Realized it pretty quickly. Is that right? But it was, I was also like, I got to do what I got to do. Like, I'm going to have to learn how to navigate this, and it'll, you know, I'm just going right. to have to do it. So I just put up with it. Mm -hmm. You know. Because what, what else are you going to do? And I was getting the opportunities, and I was like, okay. But then again, that was like why I started my company, because I found myself working with workers like who were dying and in these awful working conditions while being in like terrible, like a terribly racist, sexist environment myself that explicitly was just... Explicitly so? Oh, or was it like all... Explicitly so. Like it was... It was bad. Yeah. It was really bad. Yeah. But it was also interesting because when I wrote my book, right, I, we had a very, let's say, contentious separation, the nonprofit and I. And, uh, and I wrote my book, and I mentioned that I worked in a toxic work environment in Nicaragua. And so I, you looked at my LinkedIn, you right, know who it know is. Right, exactly what it is. Yeah. Because the organization's and, still around. Yeah, the organization's okay. still around. And the, the guy... The dude's still running it? He's still running it. He called my attorney. I was, I was, it's 2021. It's like, you know, I'm all for this DEI stuff. He's like, but she's just taking it too far. She's doing it the wrong way. We got to take her down. Oh, interesting. She's like, take her down. yeah, I want you to partner with me to take her down, was what he said. Wow. I would imagine that's not the first time you've heard it, though. Like, you're doing it wrong. It's not the first time, no. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do they mean when they say you're doing it? What's the. What he meant was she was doing, saying that to cover his ass. So that he would not be painted as a racist by going after me. Okay. For 
you know, citing the toxic dynamics. What was underneath that, though, what I think what was underneath it was also a feeling of, like, you're not grateful, right? Like, mm. and so, like, there are a lot of critiques that I've gotten in my career that come from different folks. And this is, I guess, guys a white dude. Not all white dudes have the same critique, but this guy had this critique, which was, like, you're not grateful for the opportunity I gave you. You're... I, you're biting the hand that fed you. You know what I mean? Like, you should have put up with it. It was like, do it, but do it in a way that's not uncomfortable for me, that doesn't feel like a rebuke of me and what I did for you. Now, that's one version of it. So that's the right way to do it. In his, in his mind. mind. In his mind. It's different in everybody's mind. Right. I've heard it from the other side, too. I was going to say, what are the different flavors of yeah. the right way to do it? I've heard it from the other lives? side, too. I've okay. heard it from, like activists, both inside and outside my company. Like, my company is a B2B services business. I'm not an activist or a lawmaker in the context of my company. Nope. Yes, I, am, I engage in activism outside of that sometimes, but not, that's not my business, right? Yes. And I'm not a nonprofit. That's not my business. That's right. And, you know, especially... 2020, post 2020, there were a lot of people who were coming in with like an activist mindset that had a really hard time with the business model and structure of the firm, which is inherent to the space that they're in. They're like, we're going to be activists and fuck shit up. And I was like, well, actually opposite. Like, we're supposed to fix it. Right, right. <laughs> you know, I was like, we fix, we make the company work better. You can't go in and fuck anything up. It's not you're what you're gonna do here. If you do, you're gonna get fired. Like that's so. Um, and they were just sort of like, you know, you're selling out, and I'm like, I'm running a business. So you could square that in your mind. Why couldn't other some people, people can, but some they, people couldn't. Okay, what's and, what's the disconnect in their mind? I think, and again, I mean, I'm gonna bring identity into it because it, it came from a lot of different folks of identities, but it really came from like hyper left, super progressive people. Often those people were not black, which I also felt like people of color, but not black. And I was like, you can't tell me how to do my shit. Like, <laughs> so that was very messy, wild. right? Like the idea that I was supposed to show up in a certain way as a black woman in this work was like a real... Like, as defined by someone who uh, is not a black woman. As defined by somebody who is not black, but has these certain expectations. Of yes. So... That was an, that's another critique. I'm not, it was not, I'm not activist-y enough or my approach is not activist-y enough. It's more nuanced than that. When you, but, I was gonna say, when you started, it sounds like it was framed a bit in the context of your experience in Nicaragua. Yeah. But I would imagine it was also partly framed as an opportunity to build a business. Yes. As well. Yeah. So when you made the leap to starting Ready, Set, what, what was the kind of, balance of those two in your mind. Yeah. When you did it, did you leave thinking this was a business opportunity? Did you live, leave, or did you start thinking this was going to have a certain kind of impact and the business would kind of follow from yeah. it? I don't know. So I originally thought of Ready, Set as like a labor policy consultancy, oh, right? Because okay. that's like, I had been working with labor in Nicaragua, looking at the future of work that I've been like publishing in that space. So I, that's how I originally thought of it. And there were two things that I thought of. The first was like, this is, I want to work on the future of work now because I actually had been accepted to a PhD program before I started my company. Mm. And I turned down the PhD because number one, I was like, I don't have enough, I'm too poor to do this. I don't have enough money to do it. But number two, I was like, I want to work on it now. I don't want to spend five or six years over, it was in London, in London doing this thing. And then, you know, and meanwhile, the future of work has already happened and like labor policy has already moved. And it would have been 2020 by the time I got done, if you can like imagine that. Insane. So I was like, okay. My life would have been totally different. But I was like, okay, well, I want to start a company. But then I also came out of that experience being a CEO for this guy who was like so, it was so toxic, but he was also, it's one thing to be like a, a charismatic individual. And like, he was a filmmaker. And I think he was really great at that. And um, I think it's great to be a vocal advocate. It's another to run a company, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the difference between being like an influencer or a speaker and running a company, which yeah. I see a lot. He could not run a company. So I and a lot of other women ended up 
doing that for mm -hmm. him. And I just thought, if he can do it, if he can run a business, the fuck, am, that's what it takes. Because it also peeled back the curtain for me, that experience, it demystified entrepreneurship and having your own company. And I was like- Did you come from an entrepreneurial no, family background? No, no, my parents were for government, like way back in my family history, there's a history of entrepreneurs. So my mom understood, like I think I did inherit some of the, like some of it's in my blood, yeah. but like my parents weren't that. No. And that was never painted as an option for me. Like they were always like, you take the safe road. And like many parents of like, first generation that goes to college, immigrant, minority, they're like, we, we are very risk averse. Yeah. You do the right thing. It, it demystified it for me. I said, okay, this is like, I wanna do this. And I also never wanna be in this position again. Like I never, ever, ever, ever wanna be here again in my life, working for somebody like this and having to do it to have a job. I don't wanna be like in this vulnerable position and I don't want anybody else to have to be in this position mm -hmm. again, mm -hmm. right? And so like the seed started there and I remember I moved to like Oakland and I legit had like two grand, like, like a, <laughs> no money. Wow. And I still don't know like how I attempt, I like worked in warehouses, I did whatever I had to do to start this company. Whatever gave me enough time in the daytime to like have me think about it and then start the company. But what I quickly like realized is like labor policy, nobody's buying that. Like you're not gonna pay me to tell you your workforce is misclassified. Mm -hmm. Nobody's gonna do that. <laughs> nobody's like, there's not. But what happened at the same time, and I'll never forget this, I had friends already in Oakland and I was lucky enough in the Bay Area where I had a network. And I always talk about this, like as much as I work in DEI, I went to the right schools, I had the right intros, I already had friends in VC, I already had friends who ran companies. So I had a network and we were all, my friend put together these women and VC founder kind of meetups, like we just got drinks and hung out. We were, they were talking about the business I was building and, and, and they were just talking about also like the problem of being a woman. And this was like 2015, I wanna say 2014, 2015, in the Bay and like how they were all the only ones and like, you know, and then they were also talking about they had all these positions they wanna fill and I was like, well, well, I'll just fill it with people who look like you. Mm -hmm. And so I remember I started this newsletter called Hack the Network. And the, the way it was designed was like, I'm going to leverage my network and all the jobs in my network to a distribution list of people who are from underrepresented backgrounds. Mm. And hopefully that'll bridge the divide. Again, highly idealistic. Sure. Put it, I remember I posted it on a meetup because I was on meetup. I was like, this is how I'm going to meet people. I was on a meetup, posted in a meetup group that was starting this. And like on Facebook. It shows you what time it was. And yeah. remember, I made the mistake in the meetup group of posting it with my phone number. For, I had my email, I posted, I copied and pasted my email signature, which at the time I had my phone number. And I started getting calls, calls and calls and calls. And I just saw the signups go like this. Wow. And at the time I was like working temp, some temp job in tech and I could not keep up with that, the business and the, and the newsletter and the, and so I- Was this temp job in tech, was that your first time in kind of like Bay Area tech? No, I, I kept, I did, uh, I did a lot of temp jobs. So I also needed to know the environment I was working sure, in. You know, like I can't advise a tech company I've never worked in it. So yeah. I like worked in a warehouse, worked in an office, worked mm -hmm. in a, you know what I mean? And kind of got to, try to get a feel for all of the different kinds of work that was happening and the kind of, cultures and like whatever. And I did, obviously I didn't experience everything, but I knew, I knew a little bit, I knew a little bit about a little bit. And so I started this newsletter. I started racking up these, this interest. It started getting to the point, I was like, oh, this is the company. This is, the, this is, it's a DEI company. It's not a, it's not, it's not a labor policy, whatever the fuck I was thinking. But yeah, they kind of started there and then like just kind of grew. And then I did Project Include 2016. I was like, again, the Bay was insane at that time. You just like, I just popped up places and met amazing people. And one of the places I popped up was on Twitter. Somebody introduced me to these founders. They ended up being my first clients. Mm. They had dinners, community dinners, every like third Friday in Oakland. There I met somebody who was really prominent in tech. She introduced me to Ellen Powell. I got on a project in Clue. Like, yeah. it was that kind of like... Just serendipity. Yeah, because yes. everybody was like in the mix and trying to do things. And, um, and Project Include was really what 
put me out in front and then put my business out in front. And it kind of like took off from there. The other thing I think that made me unique is coming from a legal and executive background. Mm -hmm. I understood how to formalize a lot of stuff that at the time was not really happening. You know, you had a lot of startup founders that didn't have a handbook, didn't have these kind of policies, didn't understand like how discrimination showed up in the workplace. Like, so yeah. Was there active resistance to it or was there just a mm. we're moving fast and breaking things kind of attitude where we don't have time to sit down and really Actually, no. chart this well, out? So, my clients were very self-selecting. Like I, oh, they've so. always been like coming to me, right? Mm -hmm. Because I really, anything I did outbound, it never quite worked because you had that resistance and it just, but the ones who came to me, like that was part of their ethos. Mm -hmm. They wanted yeah, that in the DNA of their company. Yeah. And so they were bought in. I think what the problem I ran into with a lot of different companies that were earlier stage that were super idealistic because so many companies were idealistic at that time too which is like the resources and the time mm -hmm. you know and really making the connections how do we, how do they do something that's like deeply meaningful and embedded into the company's dna as opposed to something that's performative right mm -hmm. i think those were the tensions that we saw even back then but you know, the only time I would get resistance would if I would be like if I got brought in for like a one-off training. Like if you think like one training is going to solve the structural issue in your company, like that doesn't work. And most nine times out of ten, if all you can get me in is for a training, it means you all aren't bought in. And I'm just training to a room of people who are like who I have to spend time convincing and aren't really about it. Oh, and you, and that is not conducive towards behavior change. They, they were like, I, can't, I got a budget of three grand. Mm -hmm. You know, let me bring in somebody to talk and get people. On. And we learned there are other ways to do it, right? Like nowadays we approach it totally different if that happens. It doesn't really happen like that anymore. Okay. But like nowadays it's like, okay, you have a budget of a couple grand. It's just you. You need to get executives into alignment. Can you get me into a room with heads of or your execs to get everybody on the same page about this mm -hmm. and like let's make a kind of plan and then we can move forward and you, they'll give you more budget after that and that's usually how we approached it. Uh, yeah. Was selling it into tech different than selling it into other industries? Yeah. How so? In some ways it was easier, right? Oh, really? Yeah, because tech is like I I love I still love working with tech and it's like it moves fast. Yep. Open to experimentation, I'm much more back then than now, I would say, right? We can talk about that. But culturally, they knew that they were shaping the future of work too. So they were like open to it. And there were all these promises that before like the corporatization of Tech 2.0 that they were really interested in fulfilling. And everybody believed in the mission that they wanted to do. And a lot of people did go into it thinking they were going to change the world. And so it was like there was an opening there. Mm -hmm. It was fun. Um, and so working with tech companies was, was different in that way. They were open to experimentation. I think that it was harder in the sense that maybe there was some resistance to the structural change piece because there's resistance to structure in general. And there was, I think, an overconfidence. And I'm going to sound like a pessimist, but I don't think that like tech in a lot of ways was over optimistic about people's own motivations and about like mm. their own biases. Like I hate to say it, but like they wanted to be the good guys in their story, good guys and gals. And I think like they did not want to acknowledge then the bias and discrimination that was inherent in the way they were doing business or acknowledge it as being what it was. It's different now. A lot of people are a lot more out in the open, for better or worse, about it. But I think back then, you know, yeah, I would see something like a referral program or Ivy League. And I'm like, you, do you see how this is? I think, no, we just want the best. And I'm like, no, you want the, you want the people that look like you. And, and, you know, you would just see, I just walk into these teams. And, like, there's, like, all of the cliches. You know, there are more dogs than black people on your team. You're located in Oakland. And... That's what it looks like. And it's like, and you, but you just saw these like bright eyed, optimistic, like that's just, you know, it's just kind of by accident and da 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 da. And like, I know even if they don't know, right, that that's what's going on. And I think. Is there a way to get them to see it? Or were there too many I think, incentives to not? 
I think there was. I think there was. And I think a lot of people, I mean, look, you say what you will about 2020, 2019, me too, or whatever, like that's what it, that's actually what it took. It seemed like it. You know, because like it was a like. A mass cultural uprising. A right? mass or cultural awareness, awareness and kind of reckoning that was both at the cultural level, but at the personal level. Because I'm just one person, right? It's so easy. And this is what the brain does to rationalize what one person's telling you, mm -hmm. especially when there's not, like the evidence doesn't, doesn't resonate with you. Like back then the evidence where, you know, we were using this sort of like university studies, which is still we use, because I mean, it's important to have peer review to data back to whatever. There were like studies by nonprofits people haven't heard of, or they didn't understand tech, or did it. There was all this sort of exceptionalism happening too, that I think kind of got washed away when mm. the cultural cultural reckoning happened. Like when the rest of the world, for example, saw Susan Fowler, and you can say you know, I think there's a lot of critique about what ended up happening there. But when they saw, like, they were like, no, no, that's like, that's just sexism. You know right. what I mean? It's like you could, at the time, I, I know if you were at Uber, you could rationalize it. And it's engineers being engineers. And it's just the way we do business, da, 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 da. But then you have a whole world looking at you and saying, actually, you know, you're not that different. Okay. Well, and I would imagine a lot of women who said, same things happened to me. Yeah, I, exactly. I, I thought I was the one who needed to, yeah, I was the exception. I thought they were the only one. Yeah, yeah. Right. That too, that too, yeah. right? All of a sudden people started to connect the dots mm -hmm. where it really was not individual, it was systemic. And we, and we were starting to see all the different ways it showed up in that, in that case for women in the mm -hmm. system. So what changed? What do you mean what changed? Like what changed as a result of those movements or to now? It seemed like there was a lot of energy in that direction to be, yeah. to have harder conversations maybe, to yeah. be more introspective about the cultures that people were building and how they were building it. And it feels like the tide has shifted. Yeah. Almost 180. Almost 180. And I, and I actually have a, more, I have a more optimistic view of it. So I will say that I think there's a framing and I can't tell you how many reporters call me and they're like, tell me about the death of DEI. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and it almost becomes like the self-fulfilling prophecy, right? And so I don't like, I don't do those stories a lot of time because it's, a, much more nuanced than that, and B, if you say that narrative, if you tell that narrative, it becomes the narrative. And I think we are seeing a pullback and, and some divestment. We're seeing other companies that are still very much in it, and I say this is somebody who's running a DEI firm, and we're seeing popular sentiment mixed across the board. Like, you know, I can't tell you how many people come up to me and they're just like, this is so fucked up. Right. And like, there are a lot of people that think what's happening right now is really fucked up. And I'm going to just, I just use when that. When you say happening right now, what are sort they of, seeing that the, is? The sort of shift to the right, sort of divestment from anything related to DEI, the rollback of our human rights. We often separate human rights, civil rights, and workplace mm -hmm. protections as though they're different things. It's all part of the same bucket. Right. And so like, you know, we're seeing women saying like, okay, well, I can't get an abortion. It's getting harder for me at work. I can't get access to childcare. Now I got to be in office, you know, like, oh, I can't get fund funding in the way that I used to. It's mm -hmm. all part of the same thing, right? So they know it's messed up. You know, you're seeing people saying, okay, you got rid of affirmative action, race-based affirmative action for college and just the number of white kids who got in went up. That's messed up, right? You know? You're seeing people that you want to make the EEOC illegal. Like more and more people are starting to see it for what it is. And what, what happened, and there are a couple of things that happened. So I'm, like, I'm going to try to untangle it and forgive me if I'm like all over the place. But I think, I think people who had, whose a plan all along was for the rollback of civil rights for men, women, gay people, non-binary people, trans people, they were, oh, the whole plan, across the board, politically, economically, socially, whatever. They wanted that to happen. Mm -hmm. they, they thought that they used a lot of ways DEI as an end. And you saw it too with, they tried it with affirmative action at first, years ago, like 2015, 2016, that didn't work. They tried it with critical race theory. Most people didn't know what that was, so that had limited effectiveness. And so now, they tried it with DEI and they got some traction with that. And I think it's because, number one, everybody thought that they had an idea of what DEI is. 
and they didn't re like it's a very nebulous thing. So they could make it into the boogeyman that they wanted to make it to. And that's why that sort of was successful, that narrative shift was successful. Yeah. The second is like people, and I think rightly so, were disillusioned with it. And they were disillusioned with it for a couple of reasons. Number one, a lot of organizations took a lot, did a lot of performative things mm. with no intention of really changing. From the beginning, we at Ready Set have really tried to weed that out of our clientele. Like we like only are gonna do this if you really want to do this, right? But you had a lot of companies that put up their black boxes and made billion dollar pledges to the communities and came out with a statement every five to six weeks, you know, like you had all this stuff and there was like no real change. And then you had them like invest in that and that became their approach to DEI. Mm -hmm. DEI became associated with this performative stuff. And then there was no quality control. And I think this is a critique of the industry. And it, oh, it's, that's it, interesting. it's a quality double, control. yeah, it's a double edged sword. Cause I'll say one thing about DEI, going into DEI and another person who was in it gave me this advice cause she used to be an engineer. And she basically got chased out of her job for talking about sexism back way before I started, and she's like, early off. And she said, I got traction with DEI because it was the job that I was allowed to do. And for a lot of black and brown and women, that DEI became the lane that we were allowed to succeed in. That's one side of it. But the other side of it was there was no quality control. And there was no quality control in part because there was I think very little understanding or respect for the discipline, right? And so, you know, you had people who would equate, and this is regardless of identity, lived experience with expertise, yes. right? You had people who wanted feel good approaches, this kumbaya bullshit, let's all talk about our unconscious, what we don't know we have, but as soon as we know it will get better bullshit. And I, I mean, I, I, unconscious bias is not bullshit, but, it is if it's the only thing that you talk about and right. then you do nothing about it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, let's talk about all this feel good stuff and then we're not gonna actually talk about the stuff that has evidence. And so what you got was like, whether it was well-intentioned or not, these approaches that didn't work. So people became disillusioned with it, mm -hmm. right? They were like, well, what were they expecting to have happen? They, I think they wanted fast change. And Did they know what change looked like? I don't even know if they knew what change looked like. Yeah. I don't even know if they were ready for the change they wanted to have. I don't think like the pace of change, even though I think ch things change pretty fast, I, the, the pace of change was not used to the pace of change that they were seeing. And things were still hard. And I think that's the other piece of it. Things were still hard. So I think naturally people were disillusioned. Even people who had the best hearts, the best intentions, got tired of having these hard conversations day after day while they were also expected to do their fucking jobs. Like, you know, like, right. okay, like, let me talk about racial trauma and then go back and enter this thing into like Salesforce. Like, okay, <laughs> like, right. like it, it's hard, right. it's really hard. And like, I think people got sick of doing it and there was no real structures in place to take that burden off of individuals because there had been so much of a focus on individual change, individual approaches to systemic problems. Mm -hmm. So when the individuals got tired, it all fell apart. And then at the systemic level, when they never really cared or wanted to do it, they could divest. I do think there was a lot of public pressure in one direction that's now been sort of, there's public pressure in another direction. Other direction. And right. that gives companies an excuse. I, I think the data, shows that the risks are actually mixed across the board, but it gives people the excuse to, to divest. So I think, that's, I think that is a big part of the kind of pushback, but I think there's a broader uh, context, which I think is the historic context that this is all happening, and this pushback is not exceptional from a historic lens, it's actually part of a historic pattern, right? Mm -hmm. So if you, like in my book I talk about backlash a lot, how to talk to your boss about race, Penguin Publishing, pick it up. I talk, <laughs> I talk about it a lot because... We really good um, to that. <laughs> but I like the plug. Um, but no, I, I, I talk about it a lot because I think that 
it was re it's really important for people to be prepared for it. And, you know, we talked earlier in this interview about my naiveness going into Silicon Valley, going into this work. And I think a lot of people came with n n like naivete, which is rooted in the wanting to be like good thing. Like you want other people to be good. You want to be good. You want to think that everybody wants progress. You want to think that it's like linear, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. a lot of people quote Martin Luther King, they quote the parts of him they like, you know, the, uh, the, moral, they like. <laughs> it's true. True. the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice, right. you know, and I always say it only bends that way if you bent it. Like a lot of people want to think that as long as we make project progress, it'll be sustained and it's linear. The, the, the opposite is actually true, right? If you think about uh, the Civil War and Reconstruction, Reconstruction, I think, is actually a fascinating period to, 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 to study because it was like a period of a huge amount of black advancement. Mm -hmm. We're so used to thinking, oh, a civil war, and then blacks were poor forever, and why, you know? But it's actually like, no, there was like advancement, and what happened was the advancement was so dramatic that there was a concerted political, economic, social, and at times military effort to roll back those rights. You mm -hmm. got Jim Crow mm -hmm. as a result of mm -hmm. black advancement, right? And you got things like segregation, you got separate but equal, you know, you got Plessy versus Ferguson, you got the, you know, and you got these sort of different systems of work. You also had systems where, um, like, not that were like forcing black people to work, right? You got the destruction of Tulsa, you know, and these and prosperous black towns and businesses and sundown towns and all these things that were, that was backlash. Jim Crow was a backlash to, to progress, mm -hmm. right? And this didn't just happen to black people, happen, you know, with Asian folks and sort of like you look at the history of Asians in the gold rush and then anti-Asian immigration laws and Asian discrimination. Um, you know, it happened, it, it happened all over the place. And so, you know, that's part of our history. And then after you get Jim Crow, you have a brief, brief period, you know, I would say 1965 to 1980 of affirmative action, in schools, you know, the voting, the, you know, Voter Protection Act, you have, um, you know, affirmative action employment. And again, you see a rise of participation and advancement. But very quickly, those protections start to get dismantled, right? Mm -hmm. In the Reagan administration, the Bush administration, then you have the stereotype of the welfare queen. Affirmative action becomes a bad word, right? You know, affirmative action is reverse racism, even though that's actually not what the law says at all. And you get this kind of demonization. Then you have Me Too, Black Lives Matter, 2020. And- In the you, middle of that, were you, you feeling that degree of progress? I was the first time I didn't have to convince anyone that there was a problem. Mm. The first time in my career. I, I didn't have to, my job was stopped being I have to con convince you that racism is a thing or sexism is a thing. We all know it. The question is, what are we going to do about it? That was, the, that was, that was how the premise shifted. And it, then it was like, you know, and then it was like wild. It was like I would get these calls. It was like, I just want to talk about white privilege. And I was like, oh, like what? Do you? Okay. You know, it's like, let's just dig into anti Like it, just, it shifted so much. And it was like, there's a real critical unpacking too to the structural violence that, you know, people suffered under. And I, I think it was across the board in society. I focus on the workplace, but, yep. you know, in the workplace, like sexism, like there's some really gnarly shit that happened. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't just like you didn't get a promotion. You got harassed. People got raped. People got, you know, like it was not like not good. Yep. Right. You know, like very real. And, you know, with racism, like bad shit happens, right? And so I think, you know, people were contending with the violence and wanting to address the violence of those problems for the first time. It was, I, it was huge. And I think you also had, and I, and I think it's really important that, you know, people are sick of allyship and I think, okay, there are a lot of people who wear allies, like the sort of badge, like, oh my God, I got my safety pin. And you're like, yeah, but like, what the fuck did you do? <laughs> like, you put it on. Okay, like, but what <laughs> should they do? What should they have done? Uh, well, okay, like, like I mean, we, we could, we no, can. No, let's, let's do it. Yeah, like, we can, we can talk about it. And I think, and it de depends on the context, right? I'm not going to give you sort of like a blanket. Course, yeah. Right, but I think, 
the problem with, and I'll tell you what they did do to ramp up to that. So the thing about it would the, also be interesting to see since we did that walk through history. Mm -hmm. Did allyship show up the same way in each of the allyship movies? was crucial in every single one of those advancements. None of those advancements happen with the marginalized group. Like you need you, obviously the mar like like black people played a vital critical role in the civil rights movement, right? But if you look at the Montgomery boycotts, if you look at the Freedom Summer, right? And actually, you know, I talk about this in my book as well, the spectrum of allyship, how you engage allies, how you move them to action. That was a concerted strategy, right? To put political mm -hmm. pressure on the administration at the time, the Johnson administration to sign the Civil Rights Act, right? Mm -hmm. That was, that was a, and that, that political strategy depended on not just political pressure from black people, but from white parents of college students. Mm -hmm. That's what turned the tie. You know what I mean? So that's how allyship showed up there. Okay. And, I, and, 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 the, and how it showed up in 2017, 2018, 2020 is like you had, you know, with the Me Too movement, you all of a sudden you had not just women, but like people with daughters, you know, like you had people saying, wait, this is what they're facing. This is gross. Mm -hmm. Like I can't, you know, like I don't want my daughter, my wife go, it's unacceptable and putting pressure on the people who looked like them that were doing that thing. Mm -hmm. now, that, that happened during the Me Too movement. And I think during the Black Lives Matter movement, it was not the black protest that made it so, like such a sea, sea change. Black people were protesting in Ferguson. Mm -hmm. black, people were, black people have been protesting. What changed is the streets were flooded with allies, right? And it became everybody being like, we can't keep this up. And I also think that's why it was a really scary moment for mm -hmm. people who were, who did not feel the same way, yeah. right? Because they were also looking at people who look like them, who were on a different side of the fence. And I think that there was a real, there was a real risk that some very structural things could have changed that might have threatened, you know, power systems, things that we've gotten really comfortable with. I think that people like got scared by, um, and I think that like, now we're living in the backlash to that. And so when you ask like what people should have done, I think what happened in 2020, I think a lot of people showed up in a lot of great ways, right? And I think I, th that's why I kind of talked about the individual piece in the absence of the systemic piece because like that that only has like. I mean, I, I, I think it needs sustained momentum, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, when we think about some of these big societies, like sometimes it takes a long time for that progress to happen. But I, you know, I feel like in some ways bad because the, the structural reform didn't happen. We didn't get police reform. We didn't get like, you know, we didn't get Roe v. Wade codify, and I'm talking about political things because any sort of structural regulatory reform is inherently political, mm -hmm. right? So like, but we didn't get that. We didn't get more folks in the Department of Labor investigating these uh, workplace discrimination claims. We didn't get, we didn't get the structural reform. We got a lot of promises, but we didn't really get that. And so when individual steam kind of petered out, like the backlash came in and it was really effective because it didn't have to dismantle anything new. It could just dismantle what was already there and push us back. In your mind, was there a catalytic pushback moment or backlash moment? The Supreme Court decision uh, for affirmative action was probably a really big one. I think there are two. I think there are two and they're all both Supreme Court decisions. I think the because it's kind of like, it, it felt like a little bit like an avalanche, you know what I mean? So it's right. hard to know what the moment was, but there are a couple, there's like the end of Roe v. Wade, there was the sort of start of the bans in schools, the, the book bans in schools. Oh, sure. yeah. um, there was the affirmative action ruling, and I think that really kind of, there's some pushback to it, but like the, the fact that it just kind of like happened, mm -hmm. I think that that to me felt like the sea change. Okay. Yeah. How about in tech specific? I mean tech, like a lot of stuff to happen in tech. Like, 
Let me tell That's you what. Why, yeah? Let me tell you what happened in tech. Because like we were talking about DEI, but like I want to talk about the economics. Because what yeah. happened in tech was the crash, and what happened in tech was the shifting of employee power. The interest rates went up, the funding dried up, companies had to be profitable, right? We'll you, figure, you know. We'll <laughs> Who could have seen that? Who could have seen, seen, seen that coming, Bryce? <laughs> but like, you know, and so you had like a lot of this stuff for a lot of these companies, a lot of the DEI stuff, the whatever was also about, it was about the employees. It was about employee retention, employee activism, whatever. And when, when employees lost their leverage, that became less important. Mm -hmm. the, the squeaky wheels just stopped squeaking. They were just uh, happy to have a job. They were, they, they were just happy to have a job, and, and a lot of them got laid off, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of DEI departments got cut, HR departments got cut, talent acquisition got cut, because there's no... Was that, is, that a, is that a reflection of the perceived value of them internally? I think... I like, think if it were working, we, they would have kept investing in it? No, I think even okay. if it were working, they would have divested. And I'll talk about that in a yeah, second, right? Please. This This is a nice-to-have, but it's not a must-have. we got to get back to basics, mm -hmm. right? In, and we still have, you know, we still have a couple of tech companies. We have quite, quite a, I think, a few, right? Yeah. Like, tech used to be the majority of our business. Now I would say, like, it's 30%. Okay. Um, but, but I think that that was really it. That was the budget cuts, the cost of capital, the shrieking team sizes, the need to get, you know, to demonstrate profitability, mm -hmm. I think that had more of an impact on the DEI movement than anything else. And DEI ended up being a really convenient boogeyman. And I think... Um, boogeyman. Say more about that. It's easy to blame DEI. Okay, right? so it's one thing for it to be a budget issue. Yeah. It's another thing for it to be a boogeyman well, issue. Well, you know yeah, I, mean? I think that's fair. So I think it was... So in order to make it disposable, you could say, like, we're going to focus on business, but you had to say more than that. Like, it had to be a distraction. Mm -hmm. It had to be a, I think that, that's most of what, like the language you've heard. It's a distraction. It doesn't work. We, you know, employees got to get back to business. But I think in order for that to pass, I think there was still like a boogeyman narrative in society that was also making it convenient at the time. Mm -hmm. We talked about like the right wing shift in Silicon Valley. I think that's part of it, right? Okay. If your investors are saying, DEI sucks and we just got to have a meritocracy as though those two things were opposite ends of the same coin. So it's not like faulty logic to begin with. Then like you're gonna... But that's a very Silicon Valley thing. Silicon Valley has a hard time with nuance. It, it's, it's wired to be binary. Binary. But that's also like what frustrates me because I, one of the best Silicon Valley teachings that I've ever come away with is like focus on the problem. Mm -hmm. And you can apply that to this work, and, it, and, and it's amazing that, that that analytical lens is not happening. So the problem was always that the systems didn't work, which caused, which had multiple downstream effects, so right? When you say it didn't work, what does that mean? I'll tell you, okay, I'll, I'll say it exactly in plain language, right? The, the, for, for me, because I think it's important that we... I do, no, totally, yeah. I agree. If the idea is, like, focus on the problem, yeah. then we have to agree on what the problem is. And I'm just going to talk about companies, right? Because you could blow it up and talk about society or whatever. Is that organizations, companies had bias and discrimination at individual and systemic levels that impeded their business performance and negatively impacted society as a whole. Now, some organizations aren't going to care about the last part of that problem, like their negative impact on society. They're going to care, but they, but they want to make money. Yeah, but they should care about their business performance. Absolutely. But sometimes, if it's between my business performance and my whatever, my like my irrational brain, irrational brain wins, mm -hmm. right? But if you say say that that's the problem, right? And you say, okay, your problem is your bias systems, your bias individuals, and they're having a negative impact on your organization. Let's just take hiring as an example of that, right? So then you would say, okay, my hiring system is biased. My interviews viewers may have bias. It's showing up in who we hire. We got to fix it, okay? So then what the anti-DEI argument says is like, well, we don't want DEI to fix it. They never say what DEI actually is. And then they'll say, you know, DEI is quotas, which most companies don't do because quotas are illegal, right? <laughs> so, so already off top, that's kind of a false thing that they're saying, but they're saying we're going to cut quotas, so we're cutting DEI, and then we're going to have a merit-based system, ignoring the problem mm -hmm. that the system was never 
meritous to begin with, and that was what they were trying to fix DEI. DEI mm -hmm. was the tool. They just decided to make it a, the problem, so they never had to fix the underlying problem. If that makes sense, right? Completely. And so it's like, so for me, I feel frustrated because if you just focused on the problem, if you, if somebody distilled problems at the organizational level in the way that I'm forced to distill the problem I'm solving as a founder, I kind of feel like we wouldn't be here, right? If you knew that there's a problem in, and maybe hiring is less relevant, maybe your organization isn't growing, but maybe you have an attrition problem, right? Mm -hmm. If you knew that there was a problem contributing to attrition, and you get rid of a tool, because I always say DEI is a tool to solve that problem, right? DEI is just a tool. You get rid of a tool, you still have the problem, mm -hmm. right? Like, what are you gonna do about the problem? Or if you have a problem and now everybody cares about money, which they should, it's business. I'm glad they finally do. Same. If you have a problem like market share, right? Like, if I'm startup, I'm, you know, B or C stage, I've got to demonstrate product market fit. Maybe there are other people in my space. I need to increase market share. Like, that's the thing I have to do to like increase what's on the balance sheet, increase revenue, increase my margins. I got to understand the market. Yeah. And the market as it stands in the United States is rapidly diversing, right? Diversifying, right? It's you're moving in the opposite direction right now. Yeah. And yeah. your 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 company, your product designer does not understand your end user. Does not understand your buyer and does not understand like the next generation of buyers that are coming up. You want to be, okay, I'm a millennial and I've like made peace with that. You want to get to Gen Z and Gen Alpha? You all have no fundamental understanding. You, call, you don't understand your market. Yeah. You, don't understand, you don't know who you're selling to. You don't know who you're building for. And you can't just build to build because nobody's funding that shit. Nobody has that kind of money. I think because we have not articulated the problems well enough for ourselves, we get caught up in the critique of the solution or the tool, right? And so like, that's where I think companies, not just tech companies, but particularly tech companies are today. I don't know how it's gonna work. I don't know what's gonna happen with venture capital. I don't know if they're gonna start propping up companies again, right? <laughs> Rates are gonna go down, I'm just gonna flood right. the zone. Keep flooding the zone again. Um, but I think that if market conditions remain the same, I think you're still going to see businesses fail. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a reason why, even if they don't want to admit it to themselves. Yeah. In tech, I think you're, I think you're spot on. But I, I do think there are the challenge with DEI, like so many things, is like people can kind of project onto That's it right. whatever they think That's it right. means. And and I think boogeyman's a really great way to frame it because I think if you need a boogeyman, you're going to find a boogeyman. Yeah. And right now, we just haven't seen it fully play out, but it's going to play out. But this is the other thing about a narrative you can shift a narrative in a way to make you comfortable, right? So like, even if I, as somebody who's like, let me look at the data and see what's going on, if parts really happen, me as that person understands like what a root cause would be. Me as a CEO who understands the narrative of spin can also say, well, you can spin it like that or you can also spin it like this. And I know that there are gonna be people who lose opportunities, market opportunities, right? Customers employees who, even if that can be attributed to DEI, and I, let's like speak specifically, even if that can be contributed to the culture, workplace conditions, talent, kind of talent that they brought into the door, and the way that they promoted, recognized that talent, their practices, even if it's all that's the case, it's very easy to put the narrative on something else, and I'm sure that that's probably what's gonna happen. On an individual company basis, it feels relatively isolated. It, you know, the, like, I wonder if it's the prerogative of the founder to be able to say, this is the kind of company I want to build. Yeah. And maybe there's value in them saying, this is what you're signing up for if you come here. Yeah. I, is, I, there, it, is there something, to, first, and, and again, in this like world of very little nuance and yeah. tech, there's something valuable about a founder saying, like, we are in yeah. office seven days a week. Yeah. We yeah. have cots for everybody to stay. We hire in, you know, by my definition of what merit is. Do you think founders can do what they want to do? Like they'll, there may be lawsuits. No. They may lose customers. They may lose employees, you know, but 
you know, the, the, I don't think there's anything stopping a, a founder from, from, from doing that, yeah. right? It's just right. there's there are going to be consequences. So let's assume the yeah. next Mark Zuckerberg sitting out there with that next big breakthrough idea. How would you convince them to care about what you care about? Is it, is it, was it Mark Andreessen that said culture eats strategy for breakfast? Who, yeah, who did say that? I think it was him. That's okay, now you gotta look yeah, it up. Yeah, I'm like, look it now, up. now think but about I, that. But, that, but I, that's definitely a meme out there. Think sure. about that, right? Yeah. So like, you know, he's. But that's the, but the disconnect for somebody like that is they when they say culture, they're talking about like developers who stay at the office until three in the morning or who sleep on cots. Yeah, they're saying. Culture is like my idea of culture eating salespeople <laughs> who will go to the ends of the earth to close the deal. It is well, but like, like but, but that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. When they say that's what culture, they, that's, that's again, what they, like that's their, but frame. those are all sort of indicators for a thing. Like, they want like hard work, diligence, d dedication, loyalty, right. like that. Okay, like now they now they've made the equivalency that you know, in your in your in your paradigm, that that's a red meat eater. Under desk sleeper, yes. da, 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 right, da, 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 right. which may or may not Lives be true. Lives at the office, yeah, would never yeah, consider yeah. working from home. Yeah. I would yeah. actually talk to that person not as a person who runs a culture company, uh, not as a person who like builds culture tech. I would talk to that person as a CEO and a founder. And what I would say as a CEO and a founder is, and as somebody who's actually been through this myself, and we haven't even talked about that, but you can have customers knocking down your door. You can have a fantastic idea that's going to change the world. If your company doesn't work, it's not going to get done, right? Like, and I think people will tell you that healthy culture, what I mean healthy culture, culture that's people with DEI, people don't treat each other like shit. People will tell you that you can treat each other like shit and still have that happen. And I think those people are lying to you, right? Especially if you are uh, Mary or Mark or N.B. Zuckerberg or, you know, like whatever, you know, whoever you are who's like got that amazing idea. The model that people want you to follow is actually a model that is successful for like 0.00001% of people, right? And so it's like, like, if you want to get that out into the world, you got to build a healthy company. You got to build a self sustaining company. You got to build a company that people are going to be curious about and want to learn about. You got to build a company that people aren't going to bash right out the gate. And to do that, you're going to need a healthy culture. You're going to need a respectful culture. You're going to need people who understand your customers and your market from all different walks of life, right? You're going to need people who understand how to collaborate with each other. You're going to need people who know how to tell you no. Like, you're going to need all of those things. Like, they're not optional, right? So I think, like, that's what I would tell them. I would tell them that, like, if they're going to change the world, they're probably, they might not do it the way that Mark Zuckerberg did it. And they actually need to have a real company to do it. And this is the way that you get to having a real company. And what if they said, they say, I totally agree with that. I just happen to find all those attributes in people who look like me. Then you're frame is too small. So if you're going to change the world and you have a company of people that look just like you making the thing that's going to change the world, it's only going to change one corner of the world and that's your corner. So that's what I would say. I would basically tell them they're wrong. But you know, your frame is too, like that's, you're just, you're thinking small. But I love that you said it that way. But we, we just did an interview with a friend of mine who, um, named Delian, he runs a company down, or you know, start, works at a venture fund. Runs a company here called Varda. Yeah. Um, and they do um, like space manufacturing. Yeah. He's at Founders Fund, which is very polarizing when it comes yeah. to this DEI stuff. Yeah. And I saw him with he had an exchange with somebody where he said, and it kind of surprised me. He said, um, his stance on DEI doesn't mean he's not for diversity. And the point that he made with that was Varda wouldn't, they just finished a successful launch. Mm -hmm. Varda wouldn't have had that successful launch had it not been for women on the team, mm -hmm. other people on the team. So there's a certain degree of acknowledgement that, yeah. you know, exactly what you're yeah. saying. 
feels like maybe part of the DEI issue was that people wanted it mandated or people felt like they had to lower, you know, lower a bar yeah. to reach some kind, even though there wasn't a quota. Yeah. It feels like there's an acknowledgement of the value of what it is you're saying yeah. in terms of like having other voices around the table, having other perspectives around the table. Yeah. Why do you think there's so much resistance well, to the boogeyman? I think, so I think part of it goes back to what we're talking about, which is like just DEI is so broad, right? Yeah. So you, that guy is saying like, I, I don't, like he's literally saying DEI stands for diversity, equity, inclusion. I like diversity, I just don't like diversity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. And I'm, like, and, and, but, but I also get it, right? Because I think that, and I've been saying this for the longest time, I think DEI as a tool and a discipline need to evolve. And I think your friend is absolutely right to critique the tool and the discipline. And I think that's what you're getting at, right? It's like he was critiquing the tool and the discipline in the way that he saw it show up. Yes. Now, do I agree with that critique? That, that's another conversation for another day. But I do think that the existence of that tool slash with the desire of that outcome, they can exist together. I think where it may be more challenging for your friend is that like, okay, he's talking about women at the table. That's still... Were they white women from the same socioeconomic background of all of the rest of the founders that mm -hmm. are all able-bodied and dressed mm -hmm. the same? There's still an element of homog you know, homogeneity there, right? There, there is discomfort in diversity, particularly you know, the, the farther out in terms of difference we get from ourselves. And I think one thing that DEI does as a tool is that, in a sense, it forces us to reckon with that, right? Mm -hmm. Like, And so I do wonder you know, in the absence of that tool, how else you get to the thing that's uncomfortable to you? Mm. It, you know, because I think a lot of, I think that there's a lot of good critique, and I told you, like, I think that there's been some bad approaches to, and bad uses of DEI that have happened, that have created some harm, right? But I also think that, like, sometimes people react to the discomfort that DEI causes, mm -hmm. and then you don't get to the optimal outcome, right? Mm -hmm. And he, I think, is threading the needle by saying, this is an outcome I like, that's still a comfortable outcome, right? But that's actually not doing the thing that could be the optimal outcome, mm -hmm. and also taking away the tool that could get him there. Right. There's so much ambiguity in that, though. Yeah. They're wonder, at that so you've dedicated your career to this. I yeah. wonder if this is a tractable problem. I would, I would actually <laughs> ask, you know what I would have done? I would have asked a follow-up question, like, okay. what, like, what part of DEI do you disagree with? Right. I think even asking that, because then you can kind of, like, unpack it. If somebody tells me they disagree with quotas, I would say, I do too, they're illegal. Mm -hmm. And then I would say, do you mean, are what are you talking about targets? And they would probably say, yes. And then I would tell them, why targets exist, because there are indicators of bias in a particular system, oftentimes. They're not perfect indicators, but a lot of times these indicators of bias, what we see happen to do with things like representation. Yeah. So you know your hiring system is biased because everybody around the table looks like you, right? Like if you, for me, when my was doing my own biased hiring system, it was people with interesting colored hair who went to Harvard for graduate school. That oh, was what I was, that was what was around yeah. my table, right? You know? I was going to say, the cobbler's kids <laughs> doesn't have shoes sometimes. <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's like it's, if you don't have that, then how do you keep yourself, how do you keep yourself accountable? Like at Ready Set, we, we work with companies that have goals and that don't have goals because mm. they're uncomfortable with what that communicates. Yeah. Quote us, right? But then we work with them to build accountability in their systems to to mitigate whatever kind of bias is happening mm -hmm. and to track it and to make sure that the system's really operating in an optimal way. Is there any healing here? Is there any, you know, I, I said intractable before. Yeah. You've dedicated your career to this stuff. You've seen it, you know, through a million different lenses yeah. and a bunch of different companies and cultures. You know, what healing needs to happen and is this even a, you know, that is, is this really a solvable problem? You don't heal at work. Work's not for healing. Work is for, like, work is not supposed to traumatize you. Okay, and I'm gonna say that's a big, work is not supposed to further traumatize you, but work is not, like, work is not gonna heal my generational trauma, right? Like, and I know we have, like, we grew up with a Protestant work ethic. My therapist is for that. My, my healing practices are for that. That's not what work is for, but work is also not supposed to traumatize me further, right? So I, 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 that's one part of me, one part of me says that. But then another part of me says, well, 
Yeah, that's true on like a micro level, but like on a macro level, if you're building these world changing technologies, you know, you are having a global impact. Now, is that global impact going to be a good one or a bad one? If you have a negative impact on the world, are you then responsible to repair what you've done? And then how do we think about that, right? Because I, I think that there's a real argument, like we said, like that tech has done some damage, you know? Um, is there room for repair? I mean, absolutely, there's always room for repair, but I think it's hard to repair on that level when there are the, these incentives not to. Like, it's hard to want to repair when you can have so much power. It's hard to want to repair when you can make even more money and we just stratify more and more and more and more money goes up and less money goes down, you know? I think it's hard at the individual and the company level to take that initiative. Do I wish that would happen at the political level? Absolutely, but that's not who we're talking to right now. So maybe I would say like, I think it's also possible for CEOs and, and founders to maybe have a mindset, um, not of healing, but one that's a little bit more trauma informed, not one causing more harm. I have that sort of strong reaction because I also think we don't do ourselves any, um, any favors when we um, put that responsibility in a place where it's not supposed to be and we alleviate those that have the responsibility to do that of that responsibility. Me personally, I speak personally, I don't think it's a company's job to heal you. I think it's a company's job not to traumatize you. I do think, however, we should be pushing for social and political change to heal some of the damage that has been done, right? But that's probably not gonna happen when you're typing into Salesforce, right? Like that's just, it's a, that's just the, and if you expect it to happen there, I think it's a room for more disappointment, more trauma, you know, negative impacts on the people around you. And so it's important to be really careful about that. That's so good. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. that's like such a banger of an ending. Yes, that was great. Yeah. Seriously.